All right, so good morning, everybody. Thanks once again for joining us for this live lab walkthrough. We're so pleased that you could be here this morning with us. Um, I'll just say a few words of welcome uh, um, to our guests this morning. Let me just mute a couple mics here. So we're joined by Navid Navab as we explore the Topological Media Lab this morning, which is a transdisciplinary atelier laboratory for collaborative research creation. And I'll let Navid tell us more about it. Over to you, Navid. Good morning. How are you? We don't have sound. Take two. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, folks. We'll uh, try that again in just a sec. Okay, I think we're live now. Push all this stuff back into the bag here. Sorry, everyone. From Makai, you got that? Yeah, I can hear it. Hello, one, two. Okay. Here we are back with sound. Thanks, Navid. Good morning. I'll pass it over to you to get us started if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay, well uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, here we are standing at the Topological Media Lab, uh, which is in the EV building. Uh, this is uh, an interdisciplinary laboratory, uh, we, which means that we engage with a lot of different disciplines, but yet uh, when we work, we work through their inseparability. Sometimes that means tracing our steps backwards in when history went wrong and disciplines got separated or sometimes forwards making new disciplines by merging them. Um, our lab is co-directed and our co-directors are uh, David Morris right now, uh, bringing in a lot of aspects from phenomenological studies, Michael Montanero, uh, bringing aspects from media arts and dance and contemporary dance and movement, Alice Jagli working with critical materiality, and myself, uh, which I focus on interdisciplinary studies, uh, academically speaking. Um, the lab is focused on making art, but as a research platform. So when I say making art, it's more like a search for a process of ways of living with one another. And when I say not one another, I mean non-human agencies included into that. So how do we engage with one another? And that really brings the process in. What does it mean to co-create? What does it mean to collaborate? What does it mean to investigate? What do we discover? And more importantly, how is that process unfolding itself is part of what we do at the lab. And then we share our findings uh, in both disciplinary and non-disciplinary formats from uh, let's say engineering uh, papers to philosophical papers and uh, sociological papers to artworks as platforms for material engagement with our findings. Um, so yeah, I wonder if uh, we will engage in a question and answer thing or do I keep going? Um, Concordia. Just to understand what was your reach throughout Concordia, they want to know um, what are your collaborations with other departments yeah. and other faculties? What are your links with them? Okay. 
Yes. Uh, well, so just as I explained, just by the virtue of our co-directors in different faculties, uh, that itself creates a tentacle-esque system where we have tentacles in different faculties from phenomenology, uh, material, critical materialities, uh, and so forth. We are located in the EV building within design and computational arts. Uh, we we are in constant exchange with Emilio and Hexagram, yet we're not uh, within Milio. So uh, the distinction at some point becomes more like, uh, how do we institutionally separate these? But as far as our activities goes, there is more similarities than differences. So the reason we're not part of it might be more because of the way we function but our doors are open, students are more than welcome to always come in, engage with us or email us, join our meetings. By no means, this is a top-down kind of lab, um, which I could actually uh, talk about that a little bit. So sometimes you have like a research agenda within a lab where everyone works on a certain director's project or a certain project, let's say. Uh, here we come together and we have themes that emerge themes and trajectories that are of interest to investigate. Uh, these themes themselves emerge from how people engage with one another, but slowly over like 15 years uh, of activity that we've had so far, uh, that's placed us on avenues of investigation, uh, which uh, doesn't mean that anyone could come in and say, I wanna investigate this. Anyone's welcome to come in uh, to, Dis discuss with us, engage with us, and understand what we're doing, and then maneuver it and modulate what we do with us. Uh, currently, our themes in the, over the past six years, for example, have been an investigation of uh, temporality uh, and time and durée, uh, different notions of the same thing, depending if you're going to dive into materiality experience or else. Then from there, for example, we arrived at rhythmicities, temporal textures, patterns of perception, uh, which takes us to formation, formative processes. And right now, these formative processes themselves, uh, there were questions that we had as a group, which formed our next three years or so of trajectory, which is on based on complexity sciences and turbulence. So how is, it, how, how is formation itself informed by other processes? Um, I noticed there was questions about topology and topological media lab. Why topological media lab? So uh, I have to say this every time because uh, linguistic confusion is always there, but excuse me if this is too basic of a thing to mention. So we have to keep in mind that topology is not topography, uh, just because it could quickly in the morning sound like the other. Um, so top, uh, I don't need to define topography, but topology deals with, it's a field that comes from mathematics. So it's a way of formalizing, of dealing with processes, right? Uh, so it's not a thing, it's a method of formalization of how we engage with things. And topology deals with continuous transformations. So if we were to suspend for a moment, our idea of things taking for, let's say, uh, Sorry, this was, has not been rehearsed. So mm -hmm. let's say we wanna look at a whirlpool. And let's say this is a whirlpool. And for a second, maybe we could, I'm sorry, this towel has been used to clean glue. <laughs> uh, so uh, in an object oriented world, we will look at a whirlpool and we're like, it's a whirlpool, it looks like that. Whereas a, a topological process based, let's say, an ontogenic, we, like we could open these terms up, looking at the world, which says, okay, is this a whirlpool or is there some processes that informed it? If so, between this, which is a whirlpool still unformed and a formed whirlpool, which, I'm, excuse me if this is not a whirlpool, we're talking hypothetically, a formed one, is there something that's constant? Is there a process that is invariant? So finding these processes of continuity as uh, between transformations of states and phases of matter becomes a field of topology, which then trickles down or up 
it's not hierarchical uh in co-influences let's say other fields such as process philosophy so that's why we have a lot of process philosopher like alfred whitehead deleuze uh, simon Don, so forth um that are interested in topology because in process philosophy too we try to suspend our ideas of things pre-existing processes that inform their coming into being um so instead of thinking of being we think in terms of becoming continuously becoming always but then that's destabilizing so we need something to be like all right so what is there to talk about is there something that's fixed and that notion itself is very questionable but at least we could try to find threads of things that are more or less stable that ground us in studying processes of becoming the classical topological uh, example is a donut becoming a cup if you search that topology donut cup you will see an animation of a cup becoming a donut and there is a mathematical formula for that so here we don't we're not interested in coming up with new mathematical formulas we're interested in these notions and uh, it helps us both in terms of interaction design so when we're designing code do we put objects in our code or do we not uh, we'd rather not pre-assume uh, notions that for example our software and hardware environments are working with uh, so that's a technical stance it's an ethical stance it's an artistic stance it's a uh, technological stance it's all of those at once so that kind of speaks to the kind of work we do at tml we're interested in working with all of these uh, technical social ethical computational notions um pause there for a second Just before maybe we do a tour of the lab and you can show us different sections, I'm, I'm wondering because when we visit your website, there's this very clear link that is made with phenomenology and Maurice Merlo Ponty. So I was wondering, could you trace for us the link between phenomenology and topology just so that we can have a better idea? Uh, yes. Uh well, I believe I touched on it just briefly now, which was, again, if you want to study uh, processes, ontogenic processes, processes of becoming, we need some tools. So that becomes really the connection. Um, and phenomenology places us within experience. Uh, but when we say experience, when we say materiality, there is certain notions we want to uh, be careful that uh, we don't generalize. For example, when we say experience, we don't mean uh, psychologism. We don't mean that anything that's imagined is real, everything else, everything is imagined. You know? uh, it more means, I'm going to quote Misumi here. Uh, so I think in his book, uh, I believe it's semblance and event. The opening line is something is doing. That is replacing the phrase, I am, therefore I exist. Because that's, uh, I don't want to get, uh, I know this is a really abstract way of answering that, but it is relevant because as soon as you say I exist, you have a world and you have yourself, you've already presumed too much. When you say something is doing, you have placed yourself with what we were talking about, becoming, doing, process of transformation, uh, which lead to the emergence of I and the world. So then you enter an awareness of that process with phenomenology helps us do that. And as I mentioned, that is not just a philosophical question, but it's also a technical one. So how, do, how can our software interactive, interactive environments also uh, take that stance? Uh, Let's put it concretely. Let's say we're working with camera tracking uh, in a field and we want to sense movement. Movement is a very rich notion. Uh, and then you might have, a, uh, let's say, a kinet or some other uh, device that tracks a skeleton. So a skeleton immediately assumes that you have a body with this kind of form and tries to look for that. Uh, so there your that software has embodied some ideological uh, jump by is pre-assuming that a gesture is from a body and it's far too human already uh, whereas we could work with uh, notions of vorticity expansion fields of movement without uh, uh, let's say collapsing movement to geometry of 
X, Y, Z. Uh, it's richer. Uh, so these fields, as you see, already we're lost. Are we talking about philosophy? Are we talking about technical things? And that is very topological media lab because often we don't really know the distinction as we go between philosophy, phenomenology, design, art, architecture, materiality. Um, I mentioned the word materiality, so I wanted to also clear up as we, with phenomenology, we cleared up that experience, uh, ways of entering experiences, ways of entering processes of something is doing, therefore being accountable for how that doing cuts a separation between object and subject. Same with materiality. When we say materiality, we don't want to generalize that to mean physicality, because that's often another jump is made. Um, okay. So physicality would mean like, okay, when we say materiality, I really need to see and feel it to believe it. But thermodynamical processes are material processes. And I'm uh, opening this conversation because I noticed it in the questions. There was a couple of questions about materiality of what does that mean for us? So materiality doesn't mean physicality. Uh, it more means uh, things that are borrowed from materiality as uh, what is doing something is doing and that is a material process that leads to our own formation and the world uh, but we do borrow uh, about things about the material world for example irreversibility thermodynamical processes and when we look at the world of how things are formed and how things are becoming or when we talk about time when we uh, talk about formation we work via these notions and that kind of grounds us into a trajectory. And that grounds our themes of investigation that emerge over time. So then uh, I'm gonna pause here again and allow some questions to come. Maybe anything we could do in between, I know Joy has a couple other questions and we might have some from the audience, but is there anything you'd like to show us that's related to what you're saying? The space seems so yeah. fascinating. Uh, Okay, so yeah, we could maybe go here. Um, so here we have uh, simply what we have available to show. It's gonna be hard to capture on camera, but here we have one technical apparatus from uh, one of the works that's called Tangible Flux. As you see, we have a magnet underneath then that the magnet creates movement, quite simple system. And then we have some servo motors pulling down to create instabilities with some balls that move above it. So um, even though it looks complicated, it is a rather simple system. But this is, for example, an example of uh, what you could call a complex harmonic motion. Uh, so a harmonic motion would be a pendulum. A pendulum would have a harmonic oscillation. But then if you look at a double pendulum, as soon as you have two joints in a pendulum, and this is something that you should do on your own, look it up and read about that, uh, Newton's laws fail. Uh, and we enter what's called a two-body problem. Um, and the two-body problem, the more you zoom into it, we realize it's not the limit of our ignorance or knowledge or tools, even though there's disagreements between art and science and philosophy of science and scientists themselves. Uh, some people think we need faster computers, more data, but it's becoming evident that there is an inventive thrust within materiality, within the universe. And the two body problem really addresses that where uh, as soon as we have multiple oscillations into play with one another, resonances happen. Uh, we could, those are known uh, scientifically as point carrier resonances that lead to what then becomes chaos and complexity. And um, materiality, let's say, and thermodynamics is always looking for minimizing energy. So as uh, a ball or a system tries to look for a minimal and minimizing its own energy, it might uh, reach certain thresholds where it suddenly goes through a phase shift. And you get inventive formations happening that, so when I, I'm gonna turn this on and what we're gonna see is that all sorts of patterns and phase shifts happen. 
but yet I opened, I took this off so you could see that nothing of the shapes that we're seeing are coded in. The computer program is not doing anything. It's just turning on the motor, you know? Um, so let's turn that on. I recognize it might be hard to, for the camera to focus on this uh, because it's constantly uh, moving. I recommend coming on the top to get a nice view of those patterns you see. So you can see sometimes it locks into a predictable shape, right? Like right now. But as I destabilize the field, the system tries to look for minimal energy state, and off these otherworldly patterns emerge. And you can see that I can physically perturb the system. And that leads into a shift. So would that have been possible easily with, a, let's say, what we would call, um, let me turn this off. with finite state machines, uh, things are coded and uh, modeled. Here, the system didn't have to model my finger coming in, yet it reacted to it. It reacted to it, it sensed me by changing itself. And uh, that's where at the topological video, we start getting into the cross between philosophical biology and phenomenology and computational systems. So when we look at complex systems, let's say, uh, let's say we have a bunch of bubbles and you enter your finger in the bubble for the bubble to sense you, it has to rearrange itself. Our sensory motor system itself is very much similar. That's, you hear a lot of times saying perception is action. Um, so we try to trace creativity within as it precedes a human notion. Uh, then through phenomenology, we try to create uh, trace sense where does matter starts becoming alive? What does it mean? Is there a sense of sense already existing within nature? That's not the human notion of sense. Then how does it, what does it mean to collaborate with these alive agencies? Uh, so we go up and down the two meta reality, to technical to philosophical biology and back and forth. Uh, within philosophical biology, uh, sometimes maybe the term topology is not used, but ontogeny is used. Uh, there was a question of, is there examples of topology in the real world? It would be less about traffic lights, but more like um, ontogenesis of uh, developmental onto uh, ontogeny. For example, how uh, a cell is divided, creating humans uh, from a cell or from a baby to a toddler to an adult, there's something that stays continuous between those states of transformation. So that would be one example of topology in the real world. Uh, yes, yes, of course, yeah. So, um, so as I mentioned, we were working on about three, our labs uh, themes run usually about three to four years, which is kind of like correlates academically with like a cycle of a big grant project. So we were investigating time, temporality, formation, and right now we're investigating turbulence. Um, one, uh, and turbulence allows us to look at processes that lead to formative processes. Uh, here, we were looking at these pipe organs through the lens of turbulence. But that led us to a media archaeological kind of investigation. Uh, media archaeology is quickly defined as study of technologies of the past to inform uh, us about where we are right now, where we could be headed. So the pipe organ uh, or a cask of an organ uh, often seen in churches is in a way triumph of European modernism over the wildness of nature is turbulence because you have 
all of these complicated mechanics, which are not all present here, if you go behind, uh, if you climb the organs within any churches, if you ever get that experience, you see all these complicated mechanisms, often to dampen turbulence and create clean tones, which embody the musical uh, ideology of the 12th tone. So that is a triumph over nature in a way uh, to create a human predictable system that you could predict and work. That's enabling, we're not criticizing that, but we're understanding what have we given up to make that. Uh, we've dampened nature and we pretended it's not alive by kind of keeping it sedated or uh, creating systems that create slumbering chaos. So with this, we try to go to thresholds where uh, turbulence could be sounded again. So we see this in the course of music history where you have a clarinet that always sounds like a clarinet and then suddenly in the past 50 years, someone will grab a bass clarinet and start circular breathing in it and changing positions and you get all these timbral shimmers emerging. So then the distinction between noise and tone collapses and what emerges is something slightly more unpredictable, alive. And when we listen to it, we feel the aliveness because it's not like I play this tone and this happened. There is a materiality doing at the micro second level that where timbre and pitch and noise start becoming blurry. And that's, we're discovering more and more as a civilization, that's good. We could use that uh, and we could co-perform its wildness with it. Um, so this is a work in progress, which means that we're constantly exploring what happens, how can we um, bring these out. What we discovered is that at every um, pipe, this is a threshold where uh, turbulence gets stabilized. One of the thresholds, same as every chamber itself and where the air is. And we're creating pseudo predictable instabilities pseudo predictable because we want to create states. And so we have simply servo motors opening and closing so we could create uh, different avenues for air entering. And we've been able to create the sound of air passing through a door. I know it sounds like it is actually five years of research so far to create something that sounds so <laughs> non-technological, it seems backwards. But then we could work with these alivenesses and then we discover what makes it a research creation is that then it becomes an investigation of how can we find our voice again in this? How can we compose if we give up certain notions and then what are the new notions? What is the new language of co-performing a turbulence that's sounding itself? That means that we're thinking of our instrument not as an instrument anymore, but as a collaborator. Turbulence is a collaborator that's sounding and we're co-sounding with it. So it's as if I'm a dancer, turbulence is a dancer on the stage, we try to find our voice. It's not happening yet, it's a work in progress. So if I turn on the wind. This was the latest edition, so uh, still sounds funny this way. The last sound was the, uh, yeah. So anyways, that was the performance, but 
was I? I was not the performer. I can tell you that actually. Uh, it's not even a question. So then at the, um, there's versions of this where, for example, there's a turbulent process happening. Perhaps in some installation version, there's a possibility that we might be sensing fluctuations of a candle moving. We already talked about camera tracking and movement, you know, so the same techniques that would sense a human moving through vorticity and expansion, then so it could also sense a candle. Uh, and then maybe the turbulence of the candles put into play with the turbulence of the pipes, which might be affecting the wind. Um, that's not what we're going to do, but that's an example of the investigator of how could we play, put processes into play with one another, where then that creates an internally interactive system and nonlinear dynamical system where elements of nature that are arguably alive or feel alive start playing with one another, another and invent things. So that becomes of interest to us. It really blurs the line between performer, perform, composer, composed, uh, nature, culture, more importantly, or even material and discursive or a particular interest to in this lab is the distinction between material and computational. Uh, what is a computational process? Uh, it, for us, a computational process is always a material process as a set of states that go into a different set of behavior through a definable set of, let's say a topological definition of how a continuity could turn into a different sort of continuity. Uh, so that is always a material process, but we simplify it, we digitize it, and we forget the always already material, the computing universe. So in a way, we try it from the kinetic movement of the balls we saw before to the turbulence here. It's uh, we're doing this invest. It's almost an archaeology of computation within the cosmos of where did these notions that we take for granted as if being digital pre-existed the digital and what do we find by revisiting them we might find that the finite state digitization of these processes have eliminated certain connectednesses to the world where certain things have been lost and we try to look at those and gain them and add them back in And that one we won't be able to see right now because it's uh, that's new ongoing platform, but uh, it's incredibly interesting uh, platform where we have atomizers that excite the air and then you get uh, cloud formations. And uh, Nima's interested, again, working at the topological media lab, we're always, if there's one thing that ties our works together is we're not, uh, we try to move away from anthropocentric design and instead work with dynamicisms of matter. So here Nemo is not interested to use clouds as pixels, which is what, let's say, arguably what civilization is doing these days, that everything that could be controlled is con controlled, conquered, and pixelization is an example of our triumph over nature. So here atomizers excite air molecules and clay clouds, but then what Nima's discovered is that he adds heating elements which are not uh, here and creates convections of sorts. And then he's been able to create uh, what's known if you search it for yourself as Bernard convection cells, which is an example of matter self-organizing or um, another way to think, think of this platform as is a way of making ecological phenomena like complex cloud formations scalable to a time and kind of dimension that we could understand it and connect with it and again it deals with what does it mean to engage and collaborate with aliveness of nature both at a creative process and as a sensory process for us as audiences um, and hopefully next time we could show you videos or it in action Grant writing, and I know that a lot of the students that are participating in this course are interested in into continuing at the MA level, which is, I mean, grant writing is a part of the MA. Yes. So, what would you say when you are proposing or writing research proposal for such 
amazing projects. Um, do you have an end goal or how do you make your proposal um, able to capture the, the vision that you have for such projects? Yes. Uh, grant writing is, times are changing. When I was uh, studying, uh, at least when I was studying undergrad and master's, uh, no one taught me how to write a grant. And yet it is really good thing to, I'm glad that's been addressed. Uh, it's not a quick answer. And also there's grants uh, to share NFRQSC, which have their own differences to Canada Council, it's a different audience. Uh, so, and even within Shirkin FRQSC, we're always talking to who knows who. Like if within the interdisciplinary, you might have someone who's a uh, literature studies and poets on the jury and an engineer so we don't want to attack the fields while being critical if you notice you're really critical of a lot of things in the world but the language of grant writing is respectful you're adding to the discourse uh, we're not angry at european modernism we're like thankful but we're learning something together so it's about finding it's, it's about a lot of grant writing is about uh, getting rid of the density of the language a little bit and saying what's at the core of the thing you want to talk about. So it helps actually to talk to friends because if you can say it, then you can also write it. Uh, whereas writing, you get lost in complex grammars. For example, turbulence. We were just talking about turbulence. I believe we used maybe a sentence that says, we're interested in, this, in, in the inventive tendencies within matter and we want to be co-creative collaborators with it. That's anyone reads that. It, gets our stance. It's like, we're not scientists, we're artists collaborating with matter, but we're discovering something with our senses. Uh, so you really wanna make known what is it you're doing because often we borrow from philosophy, science. It's good to know where you are and then communicate it. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, our doors are also open and uh, I'll be more than happy if anyone came and asked questions and even if that meant helping people articulate what's on their mind because articulation is also part of our research here. Yeah. Since we, we understand very clearly just by entering this space that research creation is at the basis of the lab. And I'm wondering how are there alternative forms of methodologies that you use or only research creation for all of these projects? Uh, no, no, so, so we, there are all alternative, there is a hybrid of methodologies we use. Uh, because of being interdisciplinary, sometimes we have to be disciplinary. <laughs> Never said articulated that as such, but uh, uh, sometimes we we are interested in the iterativeness of uh, research creation process. Uh, research creation at its core is not about like a nonlinear process. It's really about engaging with materiality instead of measuring something about it and saying something general that's been proven. It's more like, how do we engage with this process? What can we learn? Sometimes what can we learn about our otherwise methodologies? Of, and that might take us, for example, to material sciences where we're discovering the sensate property of some sort of a membrane that does something and then becomes an engineering project. So then we might use iterative design and from there we might use engineering practices to be able to both show and work with others that have other ways of working and this, uh, publish within disciplinary journals, for example. So it's good to embrace a hybrid of methodologies depending on what is being done. Um, another methodology we use, we call it uh, performing phenomenology after Maxine she Johnson's, I believe I said her name right. Uh, yeah, Maxine Sheets. Uh, so performing phenomenology is how do we place ourselves within experience uh, and work our way out to what is being experienced. That's different than uh, just being experientially grounded, but it really means that we're responsible, accountable in other ways of how we divide the line between subject and object. So, and that's a rigorous process. So then borrowing methodologies from the phenomenology crowd of how do we navigate this process of going from the place of experience to how we formed notions and then how do we talk about that what does that mean so that's one phenomenology then there's a research creation phenomenology critical materiality new materiality 
so forth. So there's many. Now that maybe this will be my last question and we'll turn to the iPad then, but um, I know that you're very interested in music and musicology. So I'm, I'm looking at, at the back and I'm seeing uh, what, what seems to me like trumpet, but could you please speak of this installation at the back? Or... Yes, yes. Uh, so right now, um, Michael Montanero and Peter Van Haften are working on this project. We have another work also called Acrophonia. Um, and there's some similarities between, for example, the organ project, this, Echophonia. They're all sort of media archaeological investigations of musical pasts. Uh, sonically speaking, there is then more precise, not precise, more like elongated themes that connect some of our works. One is poetics of schizophonia, for example. Schizophonia is a separation of a sound from a source. Schizo means separation phono. Um, so a lot of sound reproduction technologies separate as soon as right now on your computer, as you're listening to me, you're listening to my schizophone. So if the camera disappears, you're still hearing my voice, but who is this? What is this? You know, it's a, uh, so we take that for granted because we attach it to a phenomena in this case is my visual reproduction on your screens and you say okay the source is the beat and your brain connects the source to the sonic events but there's in fact a lot more going on so one of some of our works we uh, input sounds and the moment the sound is inputted it's separated from its uh, original source, so to speak. And we question technologies of reproduction and we imagine different futures for them, where, for example, sounds are sometimes merged with uh, material processes, thermodynamical processes. In Acophonia, it was about light, uh, is about sound. Uh, excuse me. It was about uh, liquid dynamics, where uh, splashing of the water was merged with uh, sonic behavior. So then instead of working, for example, in Ableton Live to cut sounds uh, based on cultural notions or compositional notions, we imagine a speculative fictional future of what if we could liquefy your sound or what, what if we could turn your sound into light, then you would have to work with these kind of notions. So just playful ways of imagining a future, they do advance technology but the point isn't, we're not making a claim that we're creating a new sound technology, but we're imagining potential futures. And that's another goal of art of reimagining potential futures. Um, so in this one, concretely, voices are spoken, they come into an inflatable balloon where voices are meshed together and they come out as light and they process via lenses that uh, pass luminous sound, so to speak, around the room. Um, and if you touch the light, the sound gets cut, for example. So we make, we do create the make belief that it is real. Part of this theatrical, part of it's highly technical of sensing the thermodynamical processes of matter and merging it through correlative algorithms, gesture following whatnot with sound synthesis parameters. Uh, and those turn into disciplinary publications, but then the social, uh, political reflections turn into like humanities publications. So, and then overall is research creation. Yeah. <clears throat> Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I'm not Turn us around here. Give me one second. Yeah. I don't know, folks who are joining me here, uh, I know there was a question earlier on when we were at the start of the of the walkthrough about the design of patterns and how far those designs can go. So I don't know if we want to go back there. Uh, Gazelle, do you want to pipe in with what your question was? It's related to your double joint. Um, yeah, hi. Hi. Sorry, I had some uh, sound connection problem. Thank you so much. It's like this lab is 
uh, like a candy shop for a kid for me. So I uh, the, the the time that Navid was explaining about that um, mechanical instrument, the radar, as he explained, with the magnet and it had some pattern on top, moving patterns on top. I just wanted to know if they can design those patterns, decide about them, or they happen like by accident, or there's a limitation of those patterns. Um, yeah, that's my question. Yeah. A very relevant and interesting question to zoom into. So I, all of those notions within the questions are put into question, question within the process I engaged. So I don't think I can say I designed those patterns because I did not. Uh, the same way, imagine if you tap your finger on a surface of a pond. You, and let's say if you tap two fingers and you see an interference pattern, it's a beautiful pattern, did you design it? So uh, perhaps you collaborated with nature and something happened. And then let's say you started constraining those patterns to make them exhibitable and engageable. Uh, so then it becomes a design process to make some other processes inventive on its own already accessible. Uh, I would say my process then was um, creating a kinetic inactive oscilloscope. So then sometimes uh, in computational animation, animation techniques, we call a uh, field called vector synthesis, where you have chaotic oscillators creating uh, shapes that come out of movement, like uh, laser animations of sorts. So here we have a kinetic version of that. Uh, I'm going to be back in like literally two seconds. So I was only able to show you guys number. This is a triptych of works. I was able to show number two, which has many different moving elements. But if there's a single ball moving on a magnetic field, this is what would be visible clearly a more uh, closer to what I was just talking about of what looks like a vector synthesis or uh, anyways. So that was one picture to show because it was relevant. Um, and it becomes about investigation of why is this pattern emerging? Uh, how is that happening? Uh, it took a while to discover what's happening there. If you have a, a spheroid, a ball, moving on a magnet that's moving like this, the ball on the top will move like this. So you have a predictable movement. But then the ball itself has magnetic polarities, north, south. So if the field destabilizes and it catches behind, any physical system is trying to minimize energy. Uh, that's how, for example, bubbles, soap bubbles form. It's a byproduct of nature always wanting to minimize its energy paths. So the ball, shifts uh, itself as it starts to follow what's happening underneath. And then slowly this movement might get more complicated, might constantly shift. And uh, so I try to destabilize the field underneath. Uh, that leads to suddenly emergence of multiple oscillations happening. And as a result, something happens that at first was unexplainable to me. So then my research creation process was trying to understand that. But then if it was a science project, I would turn it to a lab and say, this is happening based on our measurements. We repeated it. This is what you need to know. This is the mathematic formula. Research creation goes, we're engaging with this as a sensory process. Uh, so let's look at it. Uh, in one case, you have to find it so you feel under your foot what you're seeing. And let's engage with inventive tendencies within nature. And then let's compose with it. So then that became the project patterning and formatted processes then are a big theme here. Thank you so much. Of course, there are more questions that I'd like to ask about like um, the possibility of making a magnetic field to like uh, having like more operations with that, with patterns and everything, but uh, maybe this is not a good time right now. Uh, well, doors always open, so uh, We'll come to drop by and we could discuss this more. And um, well, and I'm happy to engage any question uh, if it's a finished question. Yeah, thank you so much.
Thank, thank you for the good question. Do we have another any other questions, Anna, or are we still pop up? Nope, you're muted, Anna. Or Day Cinema is muted, actually. <laughs> there's uh, there's nothing else coming in. I'm encouraging folks, uh, but for now, okay. it looks like it's winding down. Sure. Um, well, well, I can ask one question from the questions that we had already gathered, but students were interested to know what is um, the emerging trends in, in the field that you're working in and what maybe did not exist five or 10 years ago that is completely new and exciting for you and for people coming in? Um, well, it was about 2016 when Ars Electronica had a theme called uh, Radical Adams uh, Alchemists of Our Time or Alchemists of the Future. Um, and that's the moment we realized um, there is a more uh, significant global awakening to interdisciplinary uh, fields and into radical atoms is a term uh, driven, borrowed from Hirishi Ishii's MIT Media Lab, work on, if, uh, in his own language, fighting against the pixel empire and then getting back into the uh, material dynamics to try to animate or again in his own language like to make matter dance uh, so we've seen the global trend uh, where slowly the vision of the future is not holographic screens that surveil you and tell you that your fridge is too empty go buy lettuce and then you have interfaces everywhere uh, and where you could actually co-create dance with matter and have fun have it, or embrace the indeterminate tendencies within nature and unfolding processes, not as something that needs to be conquered and dampened, but embraced and worked with. And in the time of ecological disaster, that's becoming relevant too. How much do we want to control nature? And how much do we want to profit from disaster capital, uh, disasters and create technologies that circumvent it uh, instead of collaborating with nature? So that's exciting for us both at an ethical, philosophical and artistic level, because we all like working with inventive forces around us instead of being stuck with trying to do something that's here and implement it. So as an artist, it's an act of meditation also, and it's good to see the world is embracing this letting go of obsession with control and more welcoming of indeterminacy within our processes. Awesome. Uh, Do you have any other okay. That was a wonderful final start. But uh, Anna, if we wanted to go back to you too. Yeah, maybe we'll just uh, thank Naveed so much for his yeah. time and for yeah. taking us through the lab. It's been so great to to um, sample so many different projects. And Naveed, we really appreciate your, your time and energy that you've spent with us today. I'm sure everybody behind the scenes is excited uh, to have been able to be let in the Topological Media Lab for this tour. And uh, Makai, great job on the camera work. We really got a feel <laughs> for what the space looks like and what it inhabits. And, uh, and everybody, Joya, thanks so much for for speaking with Navi today. And uh, on that note, I'm gonna close up the Zoom and wish you all a great day. See you next time. Take care, bye-bye.